Hello again. This is part three of Southern European. Hello again. This is part three of Southern European Baroque art. Um, I hope you saw the other two. So here's a review of Italian painting. I told you I'd show you another timeline, and this just shows us how far we've come in 300 years. So we have the Giotto in the upper left, and then an anonymous 1400 you never saw. Um, Leonardo's Mona Lisa, 100 years ago, and then our completely reinvention of painting by Caravaggio in, around 1600. So uh, here's that word I told you about in the last show, tenebrism. Caravaggio's use of tenebrism, this is the chiaroscuro where selected forms are highlighted against a dark background, inspired generations of painters, and that is really true. So our next painter is the best example, and she is our first woman that we're really stopping to take a serious look at. This is Artemisia Gentileschi, um, a Roman woman. And this is her painting of Judith with the head of Holofernes. So this is um, a, a apocryphal story, meaning it uh, occurred between the Old and New Testaments, um, of a woman who was trying to assist the Israelite army by a, um, pretending to seduce a general of the opposing army. And when she got him in her tent, she got him drunk, and then she killed him and severed his head. So she was... Um, taking action. She was being very proactive there. So that's the story. Now she lived in Rome, the artist Artemisia Gentileschi, and she saw the work of Caravaggio, as did most of the artists at that time, and they just thought it was amazing how real these paintings looked because of this dramatic lighting and the cropping in and the darkness, all the things I told you about. So she, um, she takes this style to her own, and this is her version of um, Judith with Holofernes. Um, she had a very interesting career. Her father had been a painter and had taught her as a child how to draw and paint. And then as a teenager, he had her go study with another painting master, which is usually the way it's done, so she learns more. And uh, that man raped her, and she... Uh, sued him so there was a lawsuit and she won but she then her subjects um, take on an air of female empowerment and sort of uh, getting back at men so she does this subject quite a bit of Judith with the head of Holofernes notice how the light source is in the painting so she's holding her hand up right by that candle flame that is supposedly illuminating the whole scene and the severed head of Holofernes is right at the very bottom of the picture frame so it's uh, intruding into our space again very dramatic and here's another one of her paintings of the same subject this one I think is not painted as well I think the anatomy of um, Judith is a little bit strange. I'm not sure what's going on there. But this one's much more dramatic in terms of the beheading because it's actually showing her in the act of cutting the head and there's blood spraying out of his jugular vein and um, blood all over this white sheet, which is right in the foreground. So you can't miss it. And also very tenebristic very dark, dark space. So that was it for Italy. Now we're going to go over to Spain and it's very important to realize that um, the style influence from Caravaggio became international. It spread all over Europe. Several painters from the north, from up in the Netherlands, came down to Italy just to, to look at this and to learn from it. So um, now we're going to see how it spread over to Spain, but we're only going to really look at one example, and that's this one, Diego Velázquez, um, often considered the best painter that ever came out of Spain. So here's his water carrier of Sevilla, and you can see how he's been looking at this tenebrism. He's got the water carrier, this humble man painted as a as a peasant with raggedy clothes in a very dark space, 
uh, dramatically illuminated, just partially against the darkness, cropped way in. The water bottle and the figure are both cut off by the bottom of the picture frame. Uh, so that's a very dramatic turn of events. I love this painting. I think it's fabulous. I'm not sure what this face is doing back there, but oh well. So let's move on and look at another Velazquez. So this is his um, most famous painting. It's called Las Meninas. And it's very complex for a lot of reasons. So you can look at it. It's a very large painting. It's 10 feet high by nine and a half feet wide, so super huge. You would not have room for it in your house, I'm sure. Um, and it was supposed to be a portrait of the little girl in the center, the little girl in the white dress who's the princess or the infanta uh, of the Spanish royal family. And you can see she's not alone now. She's got a group of friends, her ladies in waiting, uh, her dog, the artist, there's several people in this scene and they're posing for the painting in a room that's full of other paintings. So let's focus on the, the painting part. So here's our artist and it's as though he's looking in a mirror and doing a self-portrait, um, including this scene. So he shows himself and he shows us probably this canvas that he's included in there. So it's a, a oh, so many different uh, reflections and ideas going on here. So let's look at him. Um, there's a close-up of him. I, look at his hand holding the brush. It's so strange. It's just like a cipher. Um, on his chest, he has this insignia, this red kind of T or cross type shape that almost looks like a dagger. That was the insignia of the Order of Santiago, which was an honorary or um, order that was bestowed by the king. Now, eventually, at the end of his life, Velazquez had the order, but there's been a lot of discussion about whether he had it when he painted this or not that uh, he may have put it on his chest in the painting to suggest to the king that it would be a good idea to give him the award. Um, or he may have come back after he got the award and added it to his self-portrait. Anyway, it's just an interesting little point of conversation there. All of the paintings in this room, by the way, have been identified by art historians. So they were actually in the collection of the royal family. Now let's look at the little Infanta. So this is the subject. Apparently uh, her parents had asked Velazquez to paint a portrait of their beloved daughter. Isn't she precious? Her skirt is just so fluffy. Um, so he plays with that idea. He knows that the viewer of this painting will be her parents. And so he gives her a coy little look. Uh, she's gazing right at the viewer. Remember, the viewer is not you. The viewer is the king and queen of Spain. And then a further joke, this is actually my favorite bit, is that he includes a reflection of the king and queen in a mirror on the back wall because he knows they will be standing looking at the painting of their daughter. And so, ha ha, I know you're there. He paints their portrait. So very very fun. Now back to the Infanta. Look at the little bouquet of flowers on her dress. Sweet, huh? But if you look at them close up, they're really not flowers at all. They're just little dabs of paint. And then compare also the painting style of her face with the painting style of her sleeves. So you can see how much more detail, how soft, this lovely soft focus of her facial characteristics compared to this, this wild abandon with just uh, these untrained, undisciplined brush strokes of her dress. And yet when you look at the whole painting from a distance, it really makes sense. That, that doesn't bother you at all. And I'll bet not one of you looked at her flowers and said, hey, those aren't flowers. Uh, but this is part of the genius of Velazquez. Another Spanish painter here um, that also has some influence from Caravaggio is Francisco de Turparan. And this is a lovely painting of his showing a saint. This is a person who died for his faith. 
Um, he's a monk. He's dressed in, in these very simple white robes. He is dead here. He's chained to a tree. So all of the environment around him is lost in this darkness. All we see really is the figure standing out. So that's the tenebrism. Um, and I also love the modeling of the white fabric. I think it's beautiful and it, it gives a sense of real sadness and tragedy to the painting as well. So you don't need to know his story, but you know the story is there if you want to look it up. It was from England. So let's look at some more Francisco de Zurbaran. Oh, also notice he cut off this painting, so very Caravaggio. This is um, just one of his paintings of a little lamb that is trussed and ready to be sacrificed. He's got a tiny halo on there. I think it was a study possibly for this painting or it may have been something that a patron asked him to do after they saw this one. So the one on the left is a nativity showing the Holy Family with baby Jesus. And then we have a trussed up little lamb ready to be sacrificed there. I don't really like the painting of that, the style of it. It seems rather unfinished to me. Um, and on the right, we have another solo figure of a, of a monk standing there. I just always see a lot of Zerberans in museums, so I take pictures. So let's, let's move on. Our next artist is also Spanish. This is um, Murillo, and he... He had a very successful career, but it seems like most of what he did or his most popular subject was this, the Immaculate Conception, which shows the mother of Mary. This is not Mary's conception, but the mother of Mary um, becoming pregnant with her. So part of Mariology is that uh, Mary was not conceived in sin, so she is also sinless and her mother got pregnant by a miracle as well. Uh, but there is Mary's mom floating up in the skies with little pooties. There's clouds. Uh, she's standing on a crescent moon. Her eyes, I mean, this just shows her purity, her sweetness, her uh, devotion. She gazes upwards toward heaven. Um, I cannot tell you how popular this was or how many versions of it, so I'll just show you. Um, the one on the left is the one I just showed you. The one in the middle is another Murillo. Um, and just look at the similarities. The, the woman is wearing a white dress with a blue cloak wrapped around it. The putti, the clouds, the crescent moon under her foot. Um, the one on the right is by a different artist. And when I saw this over spring break at the Columbia Museum of Art, I thought it was a Murillo. But the label definitely said it was Rivera. So there you go. It was super popular. Check your addicts to see if you have one hanging around. And this is our final Murillo. It's just a bonus feature because uh, I like it. It's just two ordinary women kind of looking out of a window. It looks like a young girl and her chaperone, the woman who would uh, stay with her to make sure that she behaved herself. And it's just so different from all the, the immaculate conceptions I've seen. I really like it. So following this, there's a group, of, a small group of the Poll Everywhere questions that are about the paintings and the works of art that you have just seen. So I'm not going to narrate these. I'll just let you read them for yourself to help you prepare for um, your quiz. So there you go.